It's my pleasure to moderate this conversation with Alison, Alison Nimmo from the Crown Estate, and also Stuart, Stuart Fletcher from Bupa. And these are two people who both come into post about two, two and a half years ago into organisations that had already made public commitments to embed sustainability. So it wasn't something that they were coming into to new. So we're going to try and reflect on their experiences. And given that last year's UN Global Compact Accenture CEO survey reported that the CEOs themselves were saying that they were finding it difficult as a group to get the substantive business returns from the commitment to embed sustainability that they had been hoping for. And the challenge that they were reporting in terms of going from the pilot to, to broad scale, I think this is going to be a particularly important conversation about how these two organisations are now discovering business benefits um, from the commitment, but also some of the challenges along the way. But before we get into the conversation, perhaps just to um, ask both Alison and, and, and Stuart just to explain how you've personally got to, to where you are and, and, and just a little bit about Crown Estate and about Bupa. So, Alison, perhaps, if you'd like to kick off. OK. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I suppose I'd start by saying I came into um, sustainability in, in a business context uh, quite, uh, quite late in my career, and uh, I've been trying to make up for it uh, ever since. Um, my sort of uh, road to Damascus moment was on the road to the, uh, the Olympics. Um, not the most obvious sustainable project, you know, um, flying a whole load of people from right across the world and building these massive uh, venues for, you know, three weeks of wonderful uh, sport. Um, but Sebco had promised to that London was going to be the greenest games ever. And uh, when I got on the plane back from Singapore, uh, one of my jobs was to help set up the Olympic Delivery Authority and turn a fairly blank piece of paper on sustainability commitments into uh, delivery on the ground. And, um, you know, a lot's been written about it and the, the success of all of that and innovation was at the, the heart of that. Um, but I suppose the thing that really struck me and did convert me uh, was this idea, and it was WWF, about a one-planet game. So actually, that, that sort of fundamental thought of wake up guys, we've only got one planet of resources, we've got to really think about how we live within our means, if you like, as, as, a, as a planet. Um, and that was a really interesting seven or eight years on the Olympics for me, but it was then, well, what next? And I uh, saw an advert in the, uh, the Sunday Times for uh, the Crown Estate looking for a new chief executive. And when you look at the, the sort of the, the reach and the diversity of the Crown Estate business and just the nature of the business, very long term, uh, values uh, driven, um, a portfolio to die for from sort of uh, 10 million square feet here in London, you know, Regent Street and St. James's through to one of the largest commercial rural landowners in the UK, half the foreshore, or as we call it, our favourite beaches in the UK, seabed and our green energy business. Uh, and then, of course, Windsor. You thought, wow, what a, what a great job to take um, a lot of the things I'd learned uh, on the, uh, the Olympics and my career before that uh, and really try and help the organisation you know, embed sustainability and um, uh, drive it to further success. Um, I've been there two and a half years, so Stuart's been in uh, Bupa just, just about the same length yeah. of time as well, and it is a bit like landing on the bridge of a very big ship, and how do you get it to change uh, direction? Um, and what we've tried to do um, is, is really build on the success of what had gone before. I mean, stewardship has been at the heart of the Crown Estate, sort of, well, forever. I mean, we were, we were invented as part of the Norman Conquest, really, but... Um, uh, what we've tried to do is uh, take a strategic approach. So we, um, uh, we were integrating it into the heart of the business. Uh, we did our first integrated report last year, which sort of uh, caused a little bit of a stir. And it wasn't that painful. And it makes a lot of sense for a lot of businesses. And we can maybe come back and talk about that. Uh, we also have been looking quite hard at how we measure. Because uh, we in the Crown Estate have a... Um, commercial mandate and we you know if we're going to really make this stick we have to make 
uh, the, the business case for that and, and prove uh, the business case. So measurement was really in, important. Um, the, the third bit, and, and I know Stuart, we, in fact, we've nicked some ideas from uh, Stuart and, and his team, is about how we mobilise the, the team around it and actually got people to believe in it, to lead in it, uh, and really empower the organisation. So less command and control uh, and much more really giving people the space to sort of uh, innovate. So we've done a lot. Um, I think I'd reflect just on three things that I have learned. I think leadership is fundamental. Um, as I say, if we're going to mainstream this, it has to improve the bottom line and you've got to be able to, to prove that. Uh, and with an organisation like the Crown Estate, it's, it's the reach and the leverage. And I'm sure we'll come on to talk about uh, supply chain and partners and how you can, there's, when we did this measurement, there was this one statistic, which is great. 99.6% of the greenhouse gas emissions produced um, from the activity in the Crown Estate portfolio result from the activity of our customers. <laughs> and it was like, well, we can either sort of say it's somebody else's problem, or we can say, well, how do we work with our customers to make it easier, not just making ourselves more sustainable, but help uh, our whole uh, supply chain. Alison, perhaps we should just go back one step because we're assuming that everyone knows just what is the, the status of the Crown Estate. So maybe just a 60-second a burst on this unique body. 60 <laughs> seconds, that's quite a tall order. Um, as I say, we've, we've been around since 1066, uh, uh, but in our modern context, we're, we're a, a public uh, corporation governed by an act of statute, the 1961 Crown Estate Act. Uh, and we're, we're tasked with managing uh, this extraordinary estate on behalf of the, uh, the nation. Uh, we can only work in the, the operate in the UK. Um, our underlying assets are owned by uh, the sovereign, um, and uh, all our money, all our what we call net revenue surplus to what you guys is profit uh, goes to the treasury. So uh, last year we. Um, sent a cheque to George Osborne for over £250 million. So uh, one of the few property businesses in the UK that pays 100% tax. <laughs> <laughs> a well-rehearsed line, if everyone heard yeah. one. <laughs> Stuart. I think it made George Osborne smile that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stuart, how did you get into, in, in, into Bupa and just, yeah. just what did you find when, when, when you went in there? Well, I guess... Two uh, years ago, so... Good afternoon, I can say now, everybody. It's after 12 o'clock. Uh, great to be here uh, again. Um, so I spent 30-odd uh, years in, in consumer goods. Um, Procter & Gamble for seven, and then uh, Guinness and its successor company, Diageo, for 26 years. So when Alan was speaking here, I was relating a great deal to what he was saying, and I almost stuck my hand up and, and made a contribution, but there were plenty. Of, well, there were a few others, anyway. Um, so 26 years in the uh, drinks business uh, before landing a CEO at Booper in March 2012. Um, and how I came to responsible business, of which sustainability is, is one piece, was actually during my time at, at Guinness and Diageo. For the last uh, 12 years of my career at Diageo, I was responsible for the international business, which included the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, included Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Asia, uh, and so I was involved in parts of the world that were societally and economically challenged and where our business uh, success relied on the success of those economies and the people living within them. And therefore, actually, that drove a great deal of engagement around the social agenda, uh, whether it was education in Latin America. Water was our big thing in Africa. So when Alan was talking about water, Water of Life was our big global uh, uh, program, which we focused heavily on in Africa in particular. Um, and then uh, also uh, building the capability of local supply. Again, something Alan was speaking about. Um, so very similar, local farming. So that I came into that. And then when I arrived in Bupa, one of the few external measures... Uh, that Bupa had um, put out there, in fact, and the only one in the whole area of responsibility was a carbon reduction goal that um, was agreed and put out by the board before my arrival, which was a 20% absolute reduction in carbon 
regardless of business growth. So absorbing business growth and reducing carbon uh, footprint by 20% by the year 2015, and that had been in place for a couple of years when I arrived. Uh, so I inherited that goal uh, and sought to understand within the business uh, how the plans were in place in order to deliver on that commitment, because my view was you put a goal out there, you deliver it. You know, what you say is what you do. And it was disappointing to find that actually beyond a small number of passionate enthusiasts, actually there was no orchestrated plan to deliver on that goal. And in fact, in the previous few years, that it, that it was, you know, three, four percent uh, reduction had been achieved uh, and nowhere near on track for delivery of the 20 percent. So I, I inherited that and then created the context for that inside of Bupa, which was the strategy that we created in, 2020 called, uh, in 2012 called Bupa 2020, where, uh, to Alison's point, uh, actually the whole sustainability agenda, not just carbon, became an integrated part of the whole of fulfilling our purpose of longer, healthier, happier lives. Uh, and sustainability, to me, is absolutely a core of longer, healthier, happier lives. That's what Bupa was created for in 1947. So we're not quite 1066 and all that. Uh, 1947, when Bupa was created, um, with a, a purpose uh, outlined in the objects of Bupa of prevent, relieve and cure sickness and ill health of every kind. Today we express that in the outcome of doing those prevent, relieve and cure activities, the outcome being longer, healthier, happier lives. Uh, we're an organisation of 76,000 people now. We were 54,000 people back in 2012. We're now 76,000 people. We have substantial on-the-ground operations in the UK, Australia, Spain, Poland, Hong Kong, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, India, Thailand, uh, Chile now as of February of this year, uh, and in the US looking after our Latin American business and through a joint venture that we have, which now gives us access to the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, hospital and provider network in the US. So we're a pretty, it's 25% of the businesses in the UK, 75% is international. Um, and uh, we have, uh, we have a, like you, we have a, a, a pretty special status. We are a private company limited by guarantee with no shareholders and no means to distribute our profit. It was called surplus when I arrived. I, decided to call it profit for what it is, because it's a very commercial organisation. Um, no means to distribute our profit to anyone. Shareholders, uh, if the company were ever sold, no surplus could ever be allocated and delivered to any individual. 100% of the profits, the cash, the surplus, or any proceeds of sale from the business have to be reinvested back into the business for the benefit of customers today, customers tomorrow, and wider society, and that's called out in the 1947 articles. Um, and in that sense, we are owned by our purpose. That's how I think about it. Bupa's owner is its purpose, longer, healthier, happier lives, because that's where all the money goes. Thank you very much. Now, I know some of you are already tweeting about the conference and about your insights and what you're hearing. Um, and if you don't know yet the hashtag, um, but would like to start uh, tweeting, then it's uh, the hashtag RBS. 14, and we will also take questions through um, the Twitter space as well. So if, as you're listening, um, you are being struck by some of the things that Alison and Stuart are saying and want to, uh, to, to get some points across, then hopefully they will miraculously appear um, in, on my um, pad of questions to, <laughs> to, to be adding to, to the mix to, to ask Alison and, and, and Stuart. In a sense... A lot of people sitting here who are working in companies with lots of shareholders, um, including some, in, in some cases, very aggressive shareholders with some very short-term perspectives, must be saying, these guys have got it made. They've got um, no conventional shareholders. They've got this incredible capacity to be able to work for the long term. If you can't make it, succeed these ideas of, of, of sustainability, then what hope is there for the rest of us? But it, it's, it's not quite as simple as that, really, is it? So you, you both came in, mm -hmm. as I said, to an existing commitment to sustainability. Um, what was the reality? You, you both started to hint at it, and, and in your description, Stuart, of that, that one specific 
20% 20, 20 reduction without the, the, the plan of action to how to make it occur, you, 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 you've started to unpick for us. But mm. how did you decide and, and what did you prioritise in terms of putting, being able to put all of this really into practice so it really was embedded? Um, was well, I say, um, stewardship is part of the DNA in the, the Crown Estate. Um, but I mean, we're, you know, we, we're, we're, we're on our transition, and it's been a, a long transition from, a, if you like, a sort of traditional landed estate uh, into a modern, progressive commercial uh, business. So it was about taking that broader definition of sustainability. So um, there'd been a lot of focus on carbon, as you would expect, as I say, with a, a sort of a, the, the, the main chunk of the business in the Crown Estate traditionally has been uh, real estate. Uh, but we've also got a, a very successful and growing um, uh, renewable energy bu business, particularly um, uh, offshore wind, uh, carbon capture and storage, and, and wave and tidal. So it was looking at, and some bits of the business, as I say, were really pushing forward on sustainability, others less so. But there was, um, as with many companies, a very strong focus just on carbon footprint. Um, and as a business, we're now beyond carbon neutral. So it was a great opportunity to sort of say, well, you know, that's not job done, it's what next, really. Um, and I was, you know, I was really um, struck when I first got to the Crown Estate as we were doing some strategic uh, planning. My, um, my, uh, my predecessor, um, you can imagine, 20, 2012, his, um, uh, the, the sort of goals of the business then were um, uh, going for gold, uh, and 2012 had come and gone. So again, it gave, uh, gave the business a good platform to say, what's, what's the next 10 years? Uh, and given the Crown Estate's uh, structure, you know, we can take that long-term view. We call it sort of patient capital. So we invest through property market cycles in our offshore business. We've been investing uh, over a long term, so £100 million into growing that as a, as a part of the business. So it's really about how do we take all of the good things that we're doing and I suppose turn up the volume and, and broaden the breadth of what we were doing. Um, and actually put it into the heart of our business model in a way that actually drives the business. So rather than doing it as, if you like, a bit of an add-on and doing it in a way that some bits of the business were much better at it than others, um, actually be much more confident and put it right at the heart of the business. And uh, the chairman of the organisation is Sir Stuart Hanson, uh, former chair and chief executive of John Lewis Partnership. So from a leadership perspective, we were very much pushing uh, at, a, at an open door. And it just makes sense for us as a business in terms of where do we get our competitive advantage. Uh, and we just felt, as I say, with that breadth of forestry and rural and um, offshore green energy and at the sort of core of the business, the 20% you know, of the carbon emissions in the UK are real estate. So it was, what are we going to do? Uh, and again, part of it was standing back and sort of saying, well, I'm just obsolescence and you know there's some big challenges and key risks there adaptation in our portfolio uh, as well as real uh, business opportunities around uh, uh, green growth and then it was a question of working through the detail of you know how brave and how ambitious are we going to be and then how do we embed it in our um, uh, business so we don't just talk about it we get on and deliver. Sure. Well, I think look um, the David, the, the whole thing about, uh, well, it's got to be easier if you've got no shareholders, you know, and I, I worked in a very heavily, you know, FTSE 20 market-focused organisation that actually was long-term in how it approached its business, but had the requirement of delivering short-term. And actually, even though the ownership structure, you know, is completely different, <laughs> the needs, if you're going to make a significant difference over the long term, the need for short term success doesn't go away. And, and I think, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost set up for a, a sort of lose-lose thing by talking about long term performance as opposed to short term performance. It's delivering both. Because the way to deliver in long term performance is to have an organisation that's focused on delivering in the here and now, but sustainably. So short term performance uh, alone won't do it. And I would say there wasn't sufficient focus on long-term performance orientation within the business, and that's something that, that we shifted through the strategy. So the big shift to bring 
the focus, I think, to long term was to create a strategy in 2012 that called for things in 2020. So that was eight years away with some very clear goals. And that strategy was all about our purpose fulfilled. The, the, you know, the strategy and, uh, and the vision that goes with it is what's the biggest fulfillment of Bupa's purpose that we could imagine and beyond that which could be reasonably expected. So something extraordinary. And that's what we set out. And the three key planks of fulfilling on that purpose were around the healthcare partner to millions more people. So people living longer, healthier, happier lives in more places around the world, more people and, and, and to more effect. And what the impact that can have on side health systems and health system costs, which again is another form of sustainability. The sustainability of health systems is very challenged around the world, not just in the UK. The second plank was extraordinary business performance. And you go, well, how's that a plank of a strategy? Well, actually, you have to create a strategy to deliver extraordinary business performance so that we have as much resource as possible to be able to deliver on the healthcare partner to millions more people in more ways to more effect, um, uh, more dynamically, actually, around the world. And then the third was that people love working at Bupa. So the third plank of our strategy was to have the 54,000, now 76,000, however many will be in the future, literally love working at Bupa because we held as an executive team uh, the belief that when people love what they do, they bring more of themselves, more of their whole selves to work. That in turn affects the performance of the business and opens up the business to different thinking than when people think they're being put in a box that's just called... Uh, care home assistant or just being called a, uh, you know, a call centre operator. No, no, no. When, they, when they're really part of and engage with the purpose, they bring more and more is possible. So the strategy really has been around bringing more focus on people love working here to generate more extraordinary business performance, to enable us to be healthcare partner to millions more people around the world in more ways, and therefore deliver on our purpose. So joining the dots for people that these things really, really focus has made a big difference. And that means that, yes, we have upped our investment. So we've been investing in new operations in new countries, investing in existing businesses, and investing in carbon reduction plans that now we have, you know, we put a 25 million pound investment fund uh, for 2014 into play specifically for projects that would enable us to move from our 6% uh, reduction in footprint as at the beginning of 2014 through to 20% uh, by the end of 2015. And 25 million is the first tranche, another similar tranche in 2015. And we've got 300 projects now that we're all bid for on a four to one ratio. So local businesses had to put you know 20% of the investment in. We then funded through the carbon reduction fund 80%. All of them had to have great financial returns. So this nonsense about you can't do the right thing for carbon or sustainability and deliver profits, I don't buy. You just have to push yourself to find a way. And all of these were mid-teens return investments. And as a result of which they've got leadership, local engagement, and it's now underway. So I think what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from both of you is... This has to be the strategy as opposed to a separate yeah. uh, strategy. Absolutely. There's a, a, a very strong emphasis on metrics, on measuring those on, on, on a regular basis, yep. and on intense communication. Very similar, of course, to what we were hearing yep. from, from, from Justin King uh, earlier on this morning. Um, it sounds fantastic. But where are the challenges in making this really stick that, that you're grappling with where, for instance, the opportunity of, of, of getting some input from, from 400 people who are, who are working in, in this mm. field and, and don't always get the chance to be able to speak um, directly to, 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 to the CEOs, um, what are the kind of things that you wish that there was more capacity in your organisation to be able to make this happen faster? So I start, I mean, yeah. I, I think, look, for me, there are two biggies. One is mindset. Really, you know, leadership mindset as much as people mindset on the ground. Actually, I find it a lot easier to have people on the front line shift their mindset. The leadership and management mindset shift 
that this isn't separate from, this is part of, we are still struggling with. So do I have uh, a sufficient critical mass of the top 350 leaders in our business who get it now and are starting to get it? Yes. Do I have that operating all through the organ? No, I don't. You know, that would be a ridiculous thing to say. But how I get people to stop thinking this is separate from as opposed to part of is one of the big challenges. Uh, and the other is actually for people to create the ideas inside of that sustainability agenda. And, you know, that flows from the first one. If people see it's part of and it's essential and innovation, then I'm hoping we'll generate more because there are an awful... When you tap into it in the organisation, on the front line, people see every day where waste is and how things are taking twice as long as they need to take. So not just I'm talking about waste of material, I'm not waste of time, energy, emotional energy. People see where it is. But they don't have the freedom, back to the empowerment, they don't have the freedom to solve for it. So those are the two big challenges for me. And as a, a good Procter & Gamble brand man like, 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 like Stuart, um, well actually, I, I was a long, long time ago as, as well. I never missed a marketing opportunity either. And that whole question of, of how you empower people and then get the creativity, of, of, of course, one of the ways of... of of achieving that is through the whole idea of, of encouraging the social entrepreneurs yep. in, in, in inside the, the, the organisations to come forward and, and, and really champion the, the, mm. their ideas. And if it was difficult for a marketing man, imagine how much more <laughs> difficult it is for an ex-finance man. Right? So. <laughs> Touché. I, th I think that Alison. empowerment and belief and getting people behind it and sort of celebrating the success and the sort of the feel-good factor is, is an incredibly important uh, uh, part of it. Um, but um, and we've had very different challenges, very different businesses, really very different scales. So we only operate in the allowed to operate in the UK, and the core team in the Crown Estate is 500 people. So in some respects, it's quite easy to put your arms mm -hmm. um, around them. And you know, you, we were pushing very much at an open uh, door in terms of we, you know, we had a few. Um, rocky weeks and months when people sort of said, well, I'm going to do this. Where's the budget to do it? And we went, no, no, it doesn't work like that. You've got to go away and deliver within a brief and think right. quite creatively. I think our yeah. bigger challenge is our wider supply chain. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have um, tens of thousands of people that are in our supply chain, tenants um, uh, from the sort of um, uh, the, the, the big uh, fantastic world-class retailers on Regent Street to our uh, farming tenants. Um, you know, right across the piece. And the challenge there is, you know, how do we mobilise our supply chain and our partnerships, if you like, leverage those relationships. Mm. And, and we're, we're, at, we're very much at the beginning of, of, um, of, of that, whole, uh, that whole process. But what we've been trying to do is develop proper strategic partnerships with people uh, and being very clear whether it's um, with our managing agents or the people that we work with, our sort of designers, uh, development managers, that increasingly going forwards, we're only going to work with people that share our values and get this agenda on sustainability. So part of it is just using that whole sort of uh, leverage effect across the whole uh, supply chain. And people are getting the message. Mm -hmm. And when people start bringing the solutions to you, you know you've started yeah. to, to, to crack it. Sure. But also, um, we've got to make this you've got to make it resonate with people. I think Regent Street is a fantastic example. You know, Not only is it one of the best uh, retail uh, streets in the whole of the world, um, if you sort of scratch the surface, and you know, incredibly commercially successful. Uh, and then when you look at what we've done in terms of the protection and enhancement and investment in the heritage of the street, I mean, it's looking absolutely stunning. I just, my heart skips a beat every time I walk up it. But then you look at all the new developments we're doing, and they're cutting edge from a sustainability uh, point of view. Um, and then beyond sustainability, um, things, uh, or beyond, if you like, the more physical sustainability, the economic impact of 20,000 people working and living um, and shopping um, and being part of the Regent Street family. Um, and then on our uh, workplace, we've got workplace coordinator. We've got three of them now in the business. And on the social and economic side, um, we are matching up young unemployed people. It started off as Westminster. Now it's across uh, London through Recruit West End. 
to place young unemployed people into jobs in Regent Street and St James's. So everything from super dry in Burberry to the Ritz, getting young people into jobs. So, you know, using that as a case study and celebrating the success and the feel-good factor that gives to people working on it. It's not like any other street or any other property portfolio anywhere else in the UK or indeed I'd say the world. Thank you. Now, I've been suspiciously unbombarded with uh, tweets um, and questions. So can we go back to the old-fashioned way of actually putting your hand up and indicating that you've got a question or a comment to Alison or Stuart, or indeed to both? And do we have some questions or comments? Thanks. Um, Jason Perks from DNVGL. Um, Alison, I was really interested in your point about um, only working with suppliers who um, are aligned with your values. Just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you're going to make sure that happens and what happens when you find you're working with someone that isn't. Okay, thank you very much. So, question very specifically to Alison about supply chain. And um, it is, again, a question to Alison, actually, because I noticed that recently the Crown Estate was in the government's brand new solar strategy for the UK. And, um, and so I was just I was just very interested to, um, to hear again about the aligning of values and how you plan to go about um, this, uh, participating in this billion pounds worth of investment that is going to go ahead throughout the, um, throughout the government's estate and the Crown estate. And any further questions in this, this first round from way over the far side at all? Or there's a lady over here, please. The Crown Estate's been established since 1066, therefore by definition it is sustainable because it's been here for such a long time. So in terms of the historical aspect, how do you move people or the employees away from feeling, well, we've been here forever, so how are the initiatives that you're trying to bring on board going to change that anyway? Is it not inevitable that we are going to be here forever just by the fact that we've been here since 1066? So I'm sorry if that sounds a really silly question. but <laughs> and, and sorry, you are please? Oh, I'm, I'm Cathy Manis from uh, GSC Research in Leeds. Thank you. So, uh, whole swathe of questions to, <laughs> to, to, to you, Alison. Some interesting ones, some tricky ones as well. Um, I think on the supplier front, we, what we've been doing is really um, focusing um, sort of behaviours and culture and the clear strategy uh, within the team uh, itself. And we're now just starting to uh, roll that out to our suppliers. Part of it is getting the brief right for some of the things we're doing, whether it's new developments or whether we're, when we are uh, bringing on board new partners, for example, we just retended the, the management of, of uh, Regent Street. So massive um, from an asset management point of view and putting in clear targets within that that goes beyond just you know going around and collecting the, the, the rent. Um, and... Um, what we've also been doing is trying to communicate through a whole series of conferences. So we had our first sustainability conference uh, with our urban... Um, uh, well, actually, we've had two now. Uh, so, and we've um, we set up an awards programme. So, if you like, we're trying to differentiate with our suppliers by celebrating the ones that are doing really good things. And it doesn't half create competitive detention with the ones that are sitting in the audience and haven't got the awards in terms of sort of guessing, getting the message about what we want to do. I suppose it's a bit like where we were with health and safety 10 years ago, where the, you get to a point where there's a hurdle where you just mm -hmm. won't work with a company that right. doesn't hit minimum standards. And I think that's where we're moving on uh, sustainability. We're starting with some of our big strategic partners. So our, our partners on uh, Regent Street uh, in terms of investment partners are the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, Norwegian Investment Bank. They really get sustainability, uh, they really get what we're trying to do, and they completely buy into that whole sort of placemaking, and if you like that sort of broader sustainability brief. But the trick now is to sort of push it down the supply chain. And I think um, the bit which I assume your question was getting to was, at what point will you either get rid of people that don't hit the mark, or just say, so I, th I think in terms of our procurement and being really, really clear, and I think we'll just keep notching up uh, the, the temperature, um, as I say, starting with the strategic partners, but working all the way through the supply chain. But I think most people out there are pretty business savvy uh, mm -hmm. and they'll get it. And what we found with people, um, and we've had some great stories in our supply chain, is 
you know, it's not just the Crown Estate asking them to do that. I mean, we're not the only enlightened client out there. They can see that other clients are looking at this, and so they're looking to learn from what we're doing. So actually, they can then roll it forward to their other clients. So they see it actually as a, um, you know, being a, being a good business, being good for, good for business. Um, in terms of the solar strategy, you've caught me out on that one. <laughs> we do, we, we're doing quite a lot in terms of solar strategy in our rural estate on farm buildings and the like, but we haven't gone big into uh, solar. There's a difference between crown property and the crown estate, so I suspect if it is on the government um, estate, if you like, that's not uh, directly linked to us. Um, but you know, we, we are looking at all uh, renewable energy sort of on and offshore. One of the challenges that we have with solar is there's a clearly an opportunity in our rural estate, but um, it's slightly controversial mm -hmm. putting rural panels on, uh, on farmland. So this whole debate in, in terms of natural capital and what's the priority for using our, uh, if you like, our agricultural land, should it be food? for food, should it be for, for energy, should it be for new housing, is quite a difficult balancing act that we're in, uh, we're in the middle of at the moment, and I think solar plays into that one. Um, I think in terms of having been around since 1066, I don't think it was a stupid question at all, actually. I thought it was a fascinating question. Um, and I think there, you know, the, the Crown Estate has a number of different business areas, and one of the things we've been trying to do is get that real single sense mm -hmm. of purpose across the whole of the organisation. And I'm sure Stuart will say a little bit more about that. You know, the, the team at Windsor are very different to quite a young team that are really pushing forward on things like renewable energy. They've come from oil and gas, and they're completely passionate about saving the planet. Uh, which is very different to uh, some of our real estate teams. So there's a number of different cultures across the organisation and we're trying to really sort of pull uh, that together. But, you know, no business stands still. And uh, it's been really interesting working with the team at uh, Windsor, which is still the sort of the most traditional part of the Crown Estate uh, business. 40% of our staff, we're a, we're a £8.6 billion pound company uh, and... 40% of our staff work at Windsor, which is an £8 million turnover, um, turnover part of our business. So, you know, it's a, it's a landed estate, it's run in a very traditional way, uh, and our 10-year programme, Vision 2022, actually we've rolled out down there almost first, uh, and the, the team down there have really sort of got behind it in terms of looking at Windsor not just as a wonderful um, uh, Royal Park, but actually looking at it in terms of um, the, the visitors, the well-being, uh, natural capitals, the wonderful work they do around the, the ancient oaks, but doing it in a modern context, so much more modern work practices, and looking at the state as something that sort of evolves and, and moves on. Um, but I think that is a challenge where people feel, you know, quite secure, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, Although I would say the, there's a very strong commercial, coming back to your earlier question, you know, we have, we have clear um, commercial mandate and, and some pretty tough targets. Treasury is a pretty tough uh, taskmaster. So not only do we need to um, generate revenues, where we need to grow the business and our total return, which is a usual sort of property company uh, um, sort of mark of, of uh, if you like, shareholder return. Uh, we've got some tough targets, which is around beating the market. Um, so, as I say, this isn't about being a softer business, and it isn't being about nice to everyone, and it isn't about being cuddly in public sector. You know, what we're trying to do is, is you know, centrally prove the case that putting this in the heart of the business model and doing business differently actually improves our bottom line. Yep. And, you know... If you look back over the last five years, I think it's difficult to pinpoint one or two things, but in terms of the trends of what we're doing, I think we're getting to the point where we can uh, actually prove that business case. And do you feel that, that, that just as, as, as Stuart was saying, mm -hmm. big continuing challenge about mindset, do you feel that the mindset of your team is, 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 is there on... On, on this, and, and, and that they would similarly say, yes, we can now say there is a business case for us to be doing this? 
Yeah, I think the mindset's probably less of a challenge in, in the Crown Estate. Um, as I say, stewardship's been part of the DNA. And at the end of the day, uh, a lot of what we, I mean, we call it real estate and foreshore, but it's people's favourite beaches, it's mountains, it's forests, it's the public face of London. You know, so I think the people that have been attracted to come and work in the Crown Estate have that sort of sense of place making and sort of history. Um, so yes, working in a commercial organisation, but in an organisation that isn't just about profit, an organisation mm. that looks beyond uh, that uh, profit and bottom line. And I think, and I'm sure it's something Stuart will want to comment on as well, is that if you can get into that sort of positive cycle where you attract that kind of people and then they're really innovative about how they <coughs> keep cranking the handle. Uh, and then I think increasingly, um, uh, young talent wants to come to companies that aren't just about money. Absolutely. Yes, they have to be successful. You know, the co-op's a great example um, or warning to us all. Yep. You've got to keep your eye on profit and being a successful business and giving your customers uh, what, they, what they want. Um, but the really successful companies that, that we're working with are going beyond that profit and I think they're getting you know that next generation of new talent that's those those are the kind yeah. of companies they're looking to work with I think that you know I, what I wouldn't want to have David land is that um, the mindset is not about people wanting to work for an organization with, with the purpose that we have actually the vast majority of people in that business love the fact that we have the purpose and the status that we have that's what's drawn them there actually the mindset is shift is around having the sustainable or responsible business agenda being core as yep. opposed to something on the side. So it's that, that's the shift. But the key to it is it being seen as it's just a way to deliver on purpose because that's fundamentally why people are in Bupa, to deliver on purpose. And to your mm -hmm. point about attraction, uh, there's been a, a fantastic, we've had a number of uh, uh, appointments made in the last two years, um, where people that I would not have expected would have been putting themselves <laughs> forward, are putting think, themselves forward. But, for, but that gives you a competitive advantage, It's fantastic. It? Yeah. People want to work for purposeful businesses mm -hmm. who care about stuff, <clears throat> as well as caring about financial mm -hmm. success. And then that, then that creates the kind of environment we all want to work in. Yep. And what do you see both of you, is, is, is your leadership role, because the buck stops with, with you both. Yeah. Um, when it comes to leading on, on, on sustainability, what, what do you think is, is, is your distinctive contribution? I, I had many years ago a wonderful chairman in, in business in the community, Hector Lang, and he used to say, David, I only do those things that only I can do. Mm -hmm. What are the things that, that only you can do in the sense not because it's Stuart, not because it's Alison, but because of <coughs> virtue of the fact that you are the CEO. Um, well, I'll start with, I have a very deep-seated personal belief that life's very precious. I mean, really, life is very precious. We get one run at it, and to have it count. And over the years, maybe not as articulated in this way, it's like, make a, you know, make a difference, a big difference around me. And I think... One of the things that I can do for, in my role distinctively is to join the dots for people about how what they do really does make a profound difference, A, to the fulfilment of purpose, and B, to each other, and C, to the performance of the business. And that joining the dots for people, having them really feel essential, because they are. I mean, our business would be nothing without 76,000 people. People working in care homes on the front line, you know, it's a really challenging job, particularly when 70% of our residents have dementia patients, you know, have dementia in one form or another. That's in our care homes business. Working on the front line when you're dealing with people who are at their most, you know, urgent need of help uh, and assistance for healthcare, when you're on the telephone, a nurse in one of our call centres, that's the front line. But having them see that the business would not exist and perform <coughs> and deliver with it, that's something I can do. I can bring that to life in a very vivid way and that it counts. And it counts not just for today, but it counts for the long term of the business. Um, and I passionately believe that engaging people in the business is really key to e delivering on what our customers want and expect. So, thank you. And I sense that you enjoy that. 
I love it. <laughs> it comes across. <laughs> Alice? I think it's about setting a clear strategy and, and uh, I, I'm not, I, um, I think people expect their chief execs to be authentic about it. And mm -hmm. I mean, Stuart's just done it in much, much more eloquently than I can. But I mean, I, I do believe in this stuff. I think it's really important. And I think the team need to know that it is, as Stuart said, that long term commitment. Yep. It's not just another initiative. Uh, and then, then I very much see, once you've sort of created that clear vision and purpose, it's then to support people and help them yep. bring forward, basically be in power. So moving away from the more traditional, if you like, command and control approach to really uh, helping support people to, to get on and, and make a difference. And we had a great example in the, um, uh, the Crown Estate where... Um, uh, one of the team from offshore, Andrew Finley, came to one of our sustainability, work sustainability workshops and went, it's all very well looking at, you know, all the great things that we're doing out there and sort of making all these great plans, but we're a bit rubbish at it as a business in terms of the amount of photocopying and paper and, you know, just, you know, our cafe, oh, yeah. food waste. So it's like, well, you know, what are we going to do about that? And so we sort of said, well, you know, what are you going to do about it? And... Uh, uh, about uh, eight months ago, set up a, um, a, a green workplaces initiative. It's very much people power, yeah. and I said, right, go go away, come up with some really good ideas, yeah. and I promise you that apart from maybe the wild and wacky ones, we'll do everything. And it's been everything from green juicing to sort of um, uh, the running <coughs> club at work, uh, some great initiatives in terms of how we manage waste, just how, <coughs> we, and it's great yeah. because it's been real. Um, the, the organisation sort of taking control uh, and having that mandate to get on and, and deliver and actually have some fun along the way we as had well. We huge and ditto to that. <laughs> I mean, that, that ability to unleash the passion that exists inside your organisation for doing the right thing. Mm. I'm a bit, I mean, I've got a bit of a lousy reputation for being the sad man who reaches inside the general waste bin and lifts out the stuff that should be in the recycling bin and moves it from A to B very demonstrably in sight of people or collaring them if they put it in the wrong damn bin. That's one thing. And then, you know, this, this having fun. So we developed this Grand Miles app with the World Heart Federation last year to get the world walking. Uh, and there's been some great walking challenges. You know, 85,000 people have downloaded the app. Something like about 2 million people have participated in events around the world, and we've walked 6 million miles since we launched this ground miles thing. And again, having people walk to work, so you hear stories about how people are taking the, taking the tube less, are actually walking, you know, leaving their cars at home. One guy in Hong Kong sold his car and now cycles and walks to work. I mean, that's one, so, but you can magnify that by many, many times, and it's that stuff. Mm -hmm that gets people really engaged and makes a difference and you know in spades and that idea didn't come from the top it came from a couple of people who were, had this passionate idea in January of last year and had it up and running in September on a global launch and it's phenomenal and it's just get the organisation out of the way and just let them get it you know it's phenomenal we've, we've got a superstars program and, and one of them is uh, one of the categories is sustainability and that sort of whole celebrating success and acknowledging people going sort of above and uh, beyond it sounds like a really small thing but it's incredibly uh, incredibly Huge. powerful yeah and then I think as chief execs as I think Stuart was alluding to you've got to lead by example as well so yeah I've I'm now Mrs. Zip car, I don't have a car, and, but just how you... My Fitbit and my ground miles up running <laughs> oh, there track we go. every bloody step, everybody watching And on, on that happy note, um, I'm going to um, call these proceedings to a halt. Thank both Alison and Stuart very much indeed for sharing some of, 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 of their experiences and also just some of the practical ways in which their organisations are, are, are trying to embed sustainability and also some of the, 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 the next steps for this. So can I ask you to join me in thanking both Alison and Stuart. Thank you. Thank you.